All right. Well, it is good to be with you today. We're going to be um, in a lot of different places in the scripture today. And so if you brought a Bible, keep it handy. Um, if not, that's all right. We're going to have the scripture behind me up on the screen that you can follow along. <clears throat> but um, we are beginning a series today called The Gift of Forgiveness. And I'll tell you more about that in just a second. I want to ask you a question this morning as we get started. Once you think about this, I've, I've been thinking about it a lot over the last couple of weeks preparing for this series, but what's the, what's the best Christmas gift you've ever been given in your life? If you just had to answer that question today, what was, what's the best one that anybody's ever, like a human being, has ever given you? Um, I was thinking about that. I was thinking back, back when I was eight years old, my parents got me an Atari. Anybody, you remember, remember Ataris? Um, this was back before... Uh, Black Ops 2, Modern Warfare 6, or whatever we're on these days. But uh, this was back in the day the Atari system came out. First game I ever got was Pong. Anybody remember Pong? Uh, a few people under 40. What Pong was, it was two lines and a ball. And the ball went between the two lines, and you had to like make the ball get past the other person's line. And that was it. No level two. That was just all they gave you right there. But that, that thing blew my mind as an eight-year-old. Um, that was pretty cool. This was not a Christmas gift, but I received it uh, just about a month ago. My senior level staff guys for the 10-year anniversary of the stone got me a shotgun. Now, I'm a hunter. If that offends you, I apologize. Um, not really. I don't apologize. But anyway, I, um, I'm a hunter. They got me a Browning over and under Satori 700 shotgun. It is like a redneck dream, this shotgun is. And uh, they got me a leather case, which is probably the coolest part of it. It's a leather case that it goes in. And there's an emblem on the side of the case that has our senior level staff guy's motto, which Holland came up with. He got it from the movie Bad Boys. It says we, true. It says we ride together, we die together. And so on the side <laughs> of this leather case, it says we ride together, we die together. That, and I was thinking about it. I'm like, that, that might be it. That may be the, maybe the best gift anybody's ever given me. But um, this Christmas, you're going to get some sweaters. You're going to get some socks. You and your sister are going to exchange $50 gift cards to Target. You know, you know that ritual where you go buy a $50 gift card and she goes and buys a $50 gift card on Christmas morning. You give each other the $50 gift card to Target. That, that's going to happen. And, and I was thinking about it, and you probably know where I'm going with this, but it's sad that, that so many of us, we're going to exchange all these gifts. And we're going to give these gifts to our kids. Kids are going to give their gifts to us. And we're going to spend only maybe a handful of minutes on some Sunday mornings um, thinking about the greatest gift that was ever given to us, uh, which was the gift of Jesus. And I, I think that when, I, I think the danger is that when I say that, the, 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 that Jesus is a gift to us, that you're probably thinking, well, that, that's just preacher speak during Christmas. But the truth is, is that it's not. Jesus himself referred to himself as a gift. Don't turn there, but just listen quickly. In John 4.10, Jesus comes up to this woman, and she's a Samaritan woman. It was not okay for Jews to talk to Samaritans. And Jesus said, hey, will you give me a drink from this well that they were standing beside? And, and uh, she said, how can I give you a drink? You're a Jew. I'm a, I'm a Samaritan. And then Jesus says this in verse 10. He says, and he answered her, if you knew the gift of God, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus looks at this Samaritan woman this, in this seemingly random conversation and he says, hey, I need you to understand something. The Lord has a gift for you. It's a gift for you. It's a gift of living water. And if you will drink of this living water, you're never going to spiritually thirst again. Paul refers to Jesus as a gift in uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul begins his argument. He says, for all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You've probably heard that verse before. That if it's true that God is real and that he's alive, and he is. If it's true that God is holy and he's righteous and he's perfect and he is then it is also true that all of us have fallen short of that holiness and that perfection. All of our hearts and minds and bodies have rebelled against the Lord. And in, as a result of that, the scripture says we've fallen short of his standard of perfection. But watch this. This is good news right here in verse 24. It says, but we are justified. We're justified. That we're justified It's a legal term. It means that your sins, your transgressions, all the times you've fallen short of the glory of God have been taken away from you. 
They're taken away from you. They're wiped off your slate. That word right there means you are completely and utterly forgiven. It says, but we are justified. Now watch this. By his grace as a, everybody say that with me, gift. As a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, so you want to talk about a a pretty cool gift that we've been given? 2,000 years ago on that first Christmas night, God offered you, listen, God offered you the greatest gift you will ever be given in your whole life. Through the person of Jesus Christ, God offered you the gift of forgiveness. The gift of forgiveness. And that's why we're calling this series uh, over the next couple weeks, we're going to be doing the gift of forgiveness. Now, believe it or not, what got me thinking about this series was some marriage counseling I was doing over the last uh, year or so. So I was doing some marriage counseling, which is a fun thing to do, marriage counseling. I was involved in several cases, if you will, if you want to call them that. And, and in every one of the cases, either one or both of the parties, the spouses involved, had wronged the other one. Okay? That's usually why people are in marriage counseling. Some of uh, the, the situations involved adultery. Some of the situations involved pornography. Some of the situations involved uh, financial failures or indiscretion. Uh, indiscretion. Some of them were, were emotional neglect. But I began to, uh, to notice something that in all these relationships that I was dealing with in counseling, there was a barrier that was keeping these couples from truly reconciling with one another. There was a barrier that was keeping these couples from getting to a place of peace and healing so that they could love each other the way that God has called them to love each other. And this was the barrier because of the pain that one or both of them were experiencing, because of the hurt that one or both of them were experiencing, because of the wounds that one or both of them were experiencing, that they just could not come to a place where they could forgive the other person. Just couldn't bring themselves to get to a place where they forgive the other person. So they stayed in this conflict and this bitterness. Some of the time, listen, some of the time forgiveness was not given because the person who had committed the wrong wasn't asking for forgiveness and needed to. And some of the times in these situations, forgiveness was not given even when the person who had committed the wrong was begging for forgiveness. But the, but the person who had been wronged just couldn't give Forgiveness, and, and as I've watched this thing happen, really not over the last year, but over the time I've been counseling in my ministry, it's been disturbing to me when that happens. It's disturbing to me when, when these people just refuse to offer each other forgiveness because they're Christians. They're believers. They're children of God. And listen, I want you to hear this. Matter of fact, if you don't hear anything, just kind of tune in for these next uh, couple sentences here. If there's anybody in the world that ought to be quick to offer the gift of forgiveness, it ought to be those of us who have been given the gift of forgiveness. Amen? If there's anybody in the world that ought to be quick to offer the gift of forgiveness to another person, it ought to be those of us who have been given the gift of forgiveness. And so it was through all this, it was through this marriage counseling and seeing this, uh, this, this lack of willingness to forgive these people that had wronged them, I started digging in my own heart and started realizing there were some areas of unforgiveness in my own heart and life. I realized that there were some things my parents had done over the years um, and when I, in, in my childhood that I had never truly biblically forgiven them for. Um, I had gotten over the hurt, I think, I had overlooked the hurt in a lot of ways, but I don't think I've ever, I ever truly biblically forgave them. There are some people in my, in my, more in my present that have hurt me over the last few years. And in and, and planning a church, if you start a church, become a pastor of a church, and you pastor it for 10 years, people are going to hurt you, right? Pastor, if you're listening to this on the podcast, good news, bad news, they're going to hurt you, right? It's going to happen. And I realize that there's some people in my life that had hurt me over the last few years that I, I maybe had overlooked that transgression and gotten past it, but I hadn't really truly forgiven them. Seeing marriage counseling and the lack of people's willingness to forgive each other, I I realized that there was probably some things in my marriage, just little things in my marriage, that over the years, these small things that I had still kind of left on Jennifer's account, that I hadn't forgiven her for biblically, that were 
producing these little bits of resentment that I was carrying through my marriage. Now, Jennifer and I have dealt with those and talked about them and brought awesome reconciliation and healing. But I realized that th- these things, these little, these things I was keeping on her account, these little wrongs, was keeping me from fully loving her and walking in the joy that God had for us. And so watching these couples refuse to forgive each other revealed the unforgiveness in my heart. And church, the more I thought about it, the more I just want you to know that I'm not okay with that in my heart. I'm not, I'm not okay with it in my heart, and here's the reason. Because one of, the, one of the defining biblical characteristics, one of the defining biblical characteristics of a redeemed, regenerate, regenerate follower of Christ is a person who forgives. It's just one of the marks, the Bible says. This is one of the things that's going to be in your life if you're a redeemed child of God, is you're going to forgive. As a matter of fact, the scripture goes as far as to say that if you are not a person of biblical forgiveness, it might be because, one, you don't understand your forgiveness or you have not received the forgiveness of the Lord. And so for this week and next week, I want us as a church, I want us one, I want us to remember and celebrate. Remember, celebrate, think about, camp out on the greatest gift we've ever been given. And that is the gift of forgiveness through the the life and the cross and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want us to remember that. Go there and worship there. I also want us to consider this, that there may be some people in our lives, maybe some people in your life, in your past, or even your present that this year don't need another sweater, they don't need a tie, they don't need a Chia Pet. (laughs) But maybe the Lord is calling you to offer them, to give them the gift this year that you have been given, which is the gift of forgiveness. So for the rest of the time uh, we have today, what I want us to do is this. I want us to look at the biblical definition of forgiveness. We're going to look at the biblical definition of forgiveness. We're going to do that because, truth be told, most of us in the room don't understand what what biblical forgiveness is. We think we do, but we don't. That's today. Next week, we're going to look at how. Because this is what's going to happen today. As we get our minds around the biblical definition of forgiveness, you're going to sit here and you go, "I, I hear that, and that's a lot bigger deal than I thought it was. And you're going to say, I don't know if I can do that. You're going to hear the biblical definition and you're going to go, I don't know if I can do that for this person because of the way they've wounded me and wronged me. And so but next week we're going to look at how because the Bible tells us how to biblically forgive somebody. But in the next few minutes we have together, let's, let's talk about what does the Bible say forgiveness is. There's, I'm going to look at three things today if you're taking notes. Three ways the Bible defines biblical forgiveness. Here's the first one. To forgive biblically means that you do not take revenge on the person that has wronged you. Okay, that's step one. A biblical forgiveness is that when someone wrongs you, you do not in turn wrong them. It, it is a very, church, it's a very human response to want to wrong somebody when they've wronged you. Okay, it, we, we feel that all the time in our lives. It's a very human response to want to, want to wound somebody when they have wounded you. But what we're going to see is that step one of biblical forgiveness is that when somebody wounds you or hurts you, you don't wound or you don't hurt in response to that wound. Um, there was a, a couple in the church back in year two of the church that wounded me deeply. I'm just going to be transparent. Um... I was discipling this guy. We were meeting on a weekly basis, and one of the things I do when I disciple, I kind of let my hair down. They get to see all of me, and, and I'm just a human being just like everybody else. I sin, I fail, I struggle, I'm prideful, I'm arrogant, just like all of us are. And so what had happened in the course of this discipling relationship, there, I, don't, I don't even know what I said, but there's some things that I'd said to the guy that over the course of our relationship that he thought were arrogant, that he didn't like. And so unbeknownst to me, the guy, and this is just weird. I know you're going to think, why did this guy do this? And to this day, I don't know why he did this. But he was, he was writing down everything that I said, either theologically or, or, or whether he's, I said something prideful. He was making a list of these things that he didn't like that I said. And then he would, he would go and he'd make meetings with other pastors around the city and would discuss all the things he didn't like about me, which is just weird. But 
what most people don't understand is that I'm friends with most of the guys that are pastors around the city, and they would call me and go, dude, I had this meeting today, and this guy just went through this list of all the things he doesn't like about you, and, and, and I, he's, I heard you're discipling him. Did you know this? I'm like, no, I didn't know this. And, and, and so what I did in response is I invited the guy over to my house with his wife, and long story short, I just filleted the guy. I just unloaded on him. By the end of it, they're crying. And, of course, they never come back to the church again. It's one of the greatest regrets I have in ministry, the way I handled that situation. I literally responded in the exact opposite of the way that God calls us to respond when we are hurt and when we are wounded. There's a great story that reveals this in in 1 Samuel chapter 24. Uh, David has been uh, has found out he's going to be the king of Israel. King Saul is the current king of Israel. Saul becomes jealous of David because the people love David more than they love Saul. And so Saul sends David into exile and, and then goes and tries to kill David. And so David is running for his life. And he's sent out in the desert. He loses everything he has because of the Saul guy. And all of a sudden, Saul is, uh, is going into a cave one day to use the restroom. And David has this opportunity, sneaks up behind him. And David has the opportunity to kill him. Because David's been wounded because of Saul. David's, Saul's trying to kill David. And David maybe arguably was justified in defending himself in this moment. And, and instead of killing him, he comes and cuts the corner of Saul's robe off, which the scripture says later David even regrets doing that. But watch what David says in, in 1 Samuel chapter 24. He's speaking to Saul here and he says, Now my father, see, and did see the edge of your robe in my hand? For in that I cut off the edge of your robe and did not kill you. Know and perceive that there is no evil or rebellion in my hands, and I have not sinned against you. He says, I have not sinned against you, though you are lying in wait for my life to take it. David says, look, you're trying to kill me, but I am not going to sin against you in the process. And the verse 12 is critical. Watch. He says, may the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the Proverbs of the ancient says, watch this. David says, out of the wicked comes forth wickedness. Out of the wicked comes forth wickedness, but my hands shall not be against you. That is the opposite of the way I responded. You see, David's point is this. Wicked men take revenge. Godly men trust in the Lord when they're wronged. What I should have done, what I should have done is heard his grievances against me, wrong or right, wrong or right. Heard his grievances against me, been humble, apologized to him for any way that I had hurt him, and then shut my mouth and trusted that the Lord will judge rightly between me and him, but instead I repaid evil for evil, okay? It's the opposite of how God calls us to do it. Listen to this. This is a radical verse here. 1 Peter 3, 8. Watch what Peter says about this, about offering forgiveness. He says, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit. That's critical. Humble in spirit. Watch this. This is a radical statement. We just let it go over our heads, but it's so radical. He says, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for that very purpose, that you might inherit a blessing. Church, did you catch that? What, what Peter just said? The Holy Spirit inspired word of God. Did you, do you see what that's saying? How you and I are to respond when we are wronged? What that just said is that when somebody commits an evil against you, you bless What that just said was when somebody insults you, and we live in an age where insulting is, people have easy access to insult us. It's called Twitter. (laughs) When somebody insults you, it says, you bless. And then it goes on and just ups the ante and it says, you are called to that. That's what you, you want to know what you're called to? The verse right there just says, you're a person as a child of God, you are called to forgive. That's what you were called to. And by the way, why do we, uh, when somebody does evil against us, why do we bless? When somebody insults us, why do we bless? Here's a real simple answer. Because you've done evil against the Lord, you have insulted the Lord, and he blessed you. Right? 
And that's why we're called to do that. Okay, so that's the first one. To forgive biblically means to, when somebody offers you evil, you offer them the gift of forgiveness. Here's the number two in here. To forgive biblically means to forgive completely. That's number two. To forgive biblically means you forgive completely. All right, now let me frame this point by, by asking you this question. And everybody who's a believer here, listen to this. Let me ask you this question. How completely did God forgive you? What, what, does, what does your forgiveness look like in Christ Jesus? Your list of sins over the course of your life, how did God forgive you? Did, did the Lord forgive you partially? Did the Lord forgive you mostly? Did the Lord forgive you like 99%? No, not at all. Watch, th- watch this. Watch how the Lord forgives us. Psalms 103, verse 10. And by the way, this is one of the greatest verses in all the Bible. Listen to this. Scripture says in verse 10, it says, He does not deal with us according to our sins. That's good news. Amen? He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor does he repay us according to our iniquities. Put your seatbelt on, people. For as high as the heavens are above the earth... So is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions against us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As far as the heaven is from the earth. That seems like a long way to me. As far as the east is from the west. I don't know how far that is. It seems like a pretty long way. It says he removes our transgressions from us. And if that were not enough, I mean, we just stop right there and bring Ivy back out and start singing. Praise God. If that were not enough, that he removes our transgressions from us and then separates us from them. He doesn't stop there. In Isaiah 43, 24, he says, you have, this is God speaking. He says, you have bought me not sweet cane with honey. He says, nor have you filled me with the fat of your sacrifices. In other words, God just said, you're not doing what I asked you to do. He says, rather, you have burdened me with your sins. But watch this. He says, you, you've wearied, we, wearied me with your iniquities. And in verse 25, he says, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake. And then he says, I will not remember your sins. Hallelujah. Not only God separate your sin from you, he takes them completely off your account. But then the Lord says, I'm not even going to remember them anymore. You want to know what biblical forgiveness looks like? That is a picture of biblical forgiveness. God just said he does two things when you wrong him. One, he completely removes your sin as far as the heaven is from the earth and the east is from the west. And then he remembers them no more. That's how God forgave you. And guess what, church? That is how God calls us to forgive other people. Biblical forgiveness. When you give the gift of biblical forgiveness to somebody else, what you are doing is you are taking the sin off the person's account and then you operate towards them like it never happened. That's a picture of biblical forgiveness. But we don't forgive that way, do we? We do not. See, what I'm realizing in life is that most of us, when we, when we forgive somebody, we don't offer them a biblical picture of forgiveness. We offer them deferred adjudication. <laughs> right? When we say, okay, I forgive you, we're not really forgiving them in the biblical sense. We're offering them deferred adjudication. Some of y'all know what deferred adjudication is. Deferred adjudication, what happens when you, you break a law, you, you commit a sin, you do a wrong, what happens is you aren't punished immediately for that transgression. You, they, they, the person you've offended lets you off the hook for that sin, for that wrong. But, there's a but, but the bad boy's still on your account, right? It's still on your account, so you're in this probation period. And in any given amount of time, you commit the same transgression. You get the penalty for both of the sins. That's the way we offer forgiveness. We don't biblically forgive them. We give people deferred adjudication. Somebody wrongs us, a lot of times we're willing to overlook the sin, but that thing's still on their record. And if they wrong us again, that old sin is still there, and then the new sin's on top of that, and then there's double the, double the wrath coming, our, coming their way. 
That's the way we typically forgive people. Out of the way, in just about every conflict I've ever seen, ever been a part of, whether that's in marriage, whether that's with a roommate, whether that's with a coworker, whether that's with your parents or with your children, that's what's going on. You're not dealing with just the issue at hand. You're dealing with a string of unforgiven issues. You're dealing with a string of issues that have never truly been biblically forgiven. And so when the new one happens, all the other ones come to the surface and then, okay, that's not forgiveness. That's not forgiveness. Through the cross, you got to keep, I'm just going to keep saying this, through the cross of Jesus, you were not offered deferred adjudication. Deferred adjudication through the cross of Jesus Christ, you were offered complete and total forgiveness. And again, that is how God says to forgive other people. And if you don't believe me, that God wants you to forgive that completely, listen to Colossians 3.12. Listen carefully. Listen to this one. Okay? Put on then, the scripture says, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. All right, so here's what the scripture just said. He said, okay, you're chosen one of God. You're the holy and beloved ones of the Lord. Here's what we look like. Here's what we're doing. He says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. Put on a compassionate heart. Kindness. Humility. Meekness. That word meekness, I could do a whole sermon on the word meekness. It's critical to be, to be able to forgive somebody biblically. Meekness means strength under control. Strength under submission. Okay? Meekness. And patience, watch what it says, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. How does the scripture say we are supposed to forgive? As the Lord has forgiven you. As the Lord. He doesn't say because. He says as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Oh, wow. When we forgive biblically, it means that we forgive completely. All right, last one. Number three. To forgive biblically means that we forgive repeatedly. To forgive biblically means we forgive repeatedly. Most of us, if we're honest, if we're honest, our forgiveness has limits. If we're honest, there, there is a limit to our capacity to let somebody wound us. There's a threshold that in the back of our minds, we're like, okay, we'll let this person uh, wound us here, 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 maybe one, maybe two, maybe three times. But if there's a line, there's a line there. And if they cross that line, we're like, I'm out, I'm done. You're dead to me. That's how most of our forgiveness is given. Listen to the words of Jesus. This is a crazy verse in Luke chapter 17, verse three. He says, be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. Okay, so forgiveness doesn't mean that you don't ever challenge a wrong. It says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. But if he repents, you forgive him. And then watch this. It says in, in verse 4, it says, if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, you forgive him. I don't, I don't want to go, I don't want to get too deeply into this, um, but let me just say this. I, I don't think this means you tolerate physical or sexual abuse. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here. Okay, but what I do think it means is that you forgive. You forgive in the way that Christ Jesus has forgiven you. Jesus says whatever situ what his point, whatever situation you're in, whatever way that you're being wronged, whether roommate, coworker, parent, husband, wife, whatever it is, Jesus makes a strong statement. He says if they are sinning against you seven times a day, you forgive. Why would we do that? Why would we have that kind of endurance in our forgiveness? And I think the answer is pretty simple. I figure you and I are probably sin against the Lord about seven times a day. Probably good, good average. And if you don't think you do, then that's sin number one. Okay, so you've you got six more today. <laughs> to forgive biblically means you do not repay evil with evil. You repay evil with good. To forgive biblically means you forgive completely means the sin is taken off their account and you operate towards them like it never happened. And then to forgive biblically means you forgive repeatedly. That's a, that's a biblical picture of forgiveness. And some of you as you're sitting here today, 
One, some of you are probably mad that the Bible sets that high of a standard. Some of you, if you're anything like me, you hear the biblical definition of forgiveness and the Holy Spirit's bringing to mind some people that you haven't forgiven <laughs> biblically. You've let them off the hook. You've given them deferred adjudication, but you hadn't really forgiven them. And you're sitting there going, I don't know if I can do that. You're probably thinking, I don't know if I can pay the price. <laughs> Satan is not happy with what I'm preaching about today. <laughs> Things smoking. Some of you are thinking, I don't know if I can pay the price that it's going to take for me to forgive this person that the Holy Spirit has brought to mind. And I want you to know, everybody look at me. I want you to know if that's where you're at today. I want you to know that's a valid concern. That if you're sitting there thinking, I don't know if I can pay the price that it's going to cost me to biblically forgive this person that's wounded me as deeply as they have. It's a valid concern because I want you to know something. Every time you forgive somebody, every time you offer the gift of forgiveness to someone, there's price that's going to cost you. There's going to be a price that you have to pay. It's going to cost you something. It's never easy. But as you consider offering the gift of forgiveness to the person that the Holy Spirit has brought to your mind, I want you to consider this. Consider the cost that the Lord paid in order to offer you the gift of forgiveness. When you're asking yourself, am I willing to pay the price? I just want you to think about the, the price that the Lord was willing to pay. To offer you the gift of forgiveness. So let's just take just one second. I'm done here. But let's take one second to get our mind around the price he was willing to pay to offer and give you the gift 2,000 years ago of forgiveness. You see, here's, what, here's the price the Lord paid. God had to leave heaven to come to earth in order to give you the gift of forgiveness. Uh, God left a place of perfect peace. Think about that. He left a place of perfect peace and came to a place of utter chaos in order to pay the price to offer you the gift of forgiveness. Think about this, that the Lord left a place where there was no pain. And he came to a place where he would be tortured to pay the price in order to give you the gift of forgiveness. God left a place of perfect holiness to come to a place where he would come face to face with the, with the, with the prince of darkness in order to, to pay the price to offer you the gift of forgiveness. God left a place where there was no death and there was no tears and he would come and he would weep and he would die. pay the price to offer you the gift of forgiveness. I'd say that he paid a pretty high price to give me the gift of forgiveness. Is there somebody in your life that you need to forgive biblically? God is calling you today to pay that price to give them that gift that he gave you. Next week we're going to talk about how. Okay, it's critical. But today here's what I want to do to find the strength to do this. Let's go to the manger. Let's go to the manger today. And let's remember that it was there that God wrapped up for us in flesh the gift of himself. Right? And then let's go from the, let's go from the manger to the cross. For it was at the cross that the Lord unwrapped the gift and gave it to us of forgiveness. And let's worship there. All right? Let's pray. Father, we are in awe today. Of the forgiveness you've given us, we, we're in awe today of the truth and the fact that you did not repay our evil with evil. We're in awe today that, that you have forgiven us completely as far as the East is from the West. Lord, we're blown away today at your kindness that you give us the gift of forgiveness repeatedly. Over and over and over again, you forgive us and you're patient with us and you're slow to anger towards us and kind towards us. And so it's our great pleasure and privilege today to come to the manger, to come to the cross and to worship you there for what you've done. We say hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, let's stand together.